Welcome to another edition of the Cut Pro Wrestling Podcast. My name is Randy Zellia of BackSportsPage.com, and I'm your official host for the next uh, 45, 60 minutes of a great wrestling program, great wrestling conversation. We have Austin Urge come in with his match of the month coming up in a few minutes, and our special interview from Impact Wrestling's Rohit Raju joins me one-on-one for about a 40-minute conversation about everything from his favorite wrestlers growing up to who he models his career after right now to what's coming up for him with Impact Wrestling and much more. Lots of great things going on in the world of professional wrestling today. Look, AEW has some great program going on right now every Wednesday and Friday between Dynamite and Rampage. WWE's got Monday Night Raw and Friday Night SmackDown. Impact is live ever. Oh, I'm sorry, has new programming every Thursday. And Ring of Honor is out there as well. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, Impact Wrestling, I believe, is Thursday. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I'm trying to remember all this wrestling that's on. It's, it's, it's killing me. And also, of course, MLW, AW Dark, AW Dark Elevation, all on YouTube as well. NWA. There's just so much wrestling. So if you're a wrestling fan, it is the most wonderful time of the year or best time in the world to be a wrestling fan. There's so many different different ways of watching professional wrestling a uh, big shout out to peter rosado and the crew of we are wrestling went to their independent show this past week got to see mike law in person aj pan rob killjoy my god there was just so many great professional wrestlers up and coming stars they're checking out go check it out the the website and the twitter account we are wrestling man i gotta tell you they did a tremendous job in the guys putting their heart and soul on the line to enter, enter, entertain the fans, not thousands and thousands of fans, a couple hundred fans there, and they went all out. No pun intended, the AEW. Check us out on social media. We are the Cut Pro Wrestling Podcast on YouTube and on Facebook. We're on Twitter. Uh, we, we do have a link tree that will let you put you everywhere you want to be as far as we're concerned. It also has our episodes. So if you want to watch us mobile, we can do that. There you are. Look at that. We're on Twitter, Cut Wrestling BSP, Facebook, Cut, the Cut Pro Wrestling Podcast. We are literally everywhere, uh, we, which we appreciate your support. Check us out. Give us a follow. Give us a share. Uh, give us a review. We really appreciate it. We have Austin Urge coming up in a few minutes, as well as Rahit Raju. Quick thank you to Andrew Fumi, who is our producer. He is the guy who makes, us, makes me look as good as I can. He makes the show look great. We'll be back in a little bit after Rahit Raju with your weekly autograph signing so you can support the wrestler, help give back to them, put some more food on their table, as well as uh, get you know get an autograph, and pictures, and everything you want from those. Check it out. Right now, let's go to Austin Arch for the match of the month. If you want a top match, look no further than the Elite. This group comprised of Kenny Omega, the Young Bucks, and formerly Adam Page have demonstrated their ability to put together an amazing match. Members of the Elite have already claimed three titles for match of the month this year, and this is going to be their fourth. So let's get right into the match. On July 28th at Fight for the Fallen, the Elite squad faced off against the Dark Order and Hangman Adam Page in a 10-man elimination match. Both teams came out of the gate guns blazing. Both sides had their entrances and they were each spectacular. The Dark Order and Hangman Page had a brief video illuminating what really makes a cowboy and spelling out just how intertwined they've been over the last couple months. And it's not the chaps or the boots or even the hat that makes someone a cowboy. It's having a team there beside them, similar to how the Dark Order has been there for Hangman Page. And so Paige joined the Dark Order's ranks, donned their signature color purple, as the two parties walked down to the ring as one. And their opposition to a chorus of boos from the Charlotte crowd, ring announcer Justin Roberts gave the starting lineup for the elite squads. They wore track suits and their own version of Toon Squad jerseys um, called the Elite Squad, which were knockoffs of those from Space Jam and the Champions made their way out to get ready for this by Two Unlimited, which was heralding their arrival. So as Kenny Omega and the Bucks dribbled basketballs down to the ring, they shot some hoops before the big match, and they each had their own individual numbers, which I thought was a great touch. So with those numbers, Carl Anderson was wearing number 12, which was one of his 
big breakout years in the wrestling industry. And this was over in New Japan Pro Wrestling, along with Bullet Club. He was in the New Japan Cup, defeated Shinsuke Nakamura, beat Hiroshi Tanahashi in the G1, ultimately lost in the finals, which took place right after he beat Tanahashi. Um, he was also a World Tag League winner with Hiroki Goto. Dot Gallows were number 69. Don't really need to go into that one. It's a bit on the nose there. Nick Jackson had 777, so triple sevens, lucky number seven. Matt Jackson had his number 13, and the thing that I came up for with that was that this will be his 13th year anniversary um, coming up with his marriage to his wife. Kenny Omega, of course, had to wear number 23, reminiscent of Michael Jordan and also LeBron James now in the second remake of Space Jam. And so now getting right into the match as the action heated up, Carl Anderson and Doc Gallows were on the receiving end of some offense from the Dark Order and Hangman Page. Flurry of kicks and punches culminated with a German suplex and a high stack pin attempt on Anderson. It meant that Doc Gallows had to come in, break it up, make sure that he would still stay in the match. The interference distracted Alex Reynolds of the Dark Order for a moment. But that was all that Anderson needed with so much high, with so much history and ring IQ for himself. He was able to quickly capitalize on the chance, rolling up Reynolds, grabbing a handful of tights for the match's first elimination. So after that, with Anderson in the, in the ring alone, Dark Order was then able to capitalize, quickly beating him up in a four-on-one beatdown. Evil Uno and Stu Grayson finished him off with their fatality finisher to even out the numbers. And as the match sort of spilled over into the surrounding ringside area, Stu Grayson and Doc Gallows battled it outside of the ring over by where the fans were seated. And ultimately, they would be counted out by referee Rick Knox, something that I really like to see that countouts actually do happen if the time is right. They were outside the ring for 10 seconds, more than that, to the count of 10 for the referee. And instead of a really slow count, once you get past six, seven, eight, and nine, he kept up the same pace and just counted them out like it was his job because it is. And so he was able to keep control of the match that way. And so it was a three on three with John Silver, Evil Uno, and Adam Page against Kenny Omega and the Young Bucks. Uh, this would be John Silver's return to the ring from his shoulder injury. I think this is the first time that we've seen him uh, for sure on television in a match. I don't think he was on AEW Dark or Dark Elevation or anything like that before. So it'd be Evil Uno and Kenny Omega back into the ring and a bit as a bit of revenge from the geography lesson from a couple of weeks before where Omega taught the capital of Thailand to Evil Uno. Uno pulled out his agility and something that we've seen him pull out a couple times was a Hurricane Rana. He, executed that on Omega and a big reverse STO nearly pinning the world champion. But Omega being the world champion for a reason though, was able to counter a follow-up senton from Uno, quickly hit a V trigger and a one winged angel to pin him. And that's when Matt Jackson came into the ring and he's an absolute master at mockery. We've seen this over his fantastic run as a champion with the Young Bucks almost every single week. And in North Carolina, it was no different. He pretended to flex his muscles like John Silver to try and get in his head, but John Silver, the fan favorite, just decided to spear Matt out of his shoes instead. And that's where we sort of went into a commercial break. And on the other side, John Silver had the upper hand, a big boot to the back of Nick Jackson and a German suplex followed up by a spin doctor. It looked like it was almost a three count, but about as close as you can get or as JR would say, as close as 19 is to 20, it was a 2.99 count and he would be able to kick out. The match would then continue back and forth. The elite squad would then gain the upper hand with Adam Page being power bombed during the break out on the ring apron by the Young Bucks. So he would be out of action for a bit. And if there are three people who know how to make the most out of their environment, it would definitely have to be Kenny Omega and the Bucks, and they did just that. They wheeled the basketball hoop over from the ring entrance, and Omega held the basketball for Nick Jackson to dunk it, while Matt had John Silver set up for an indie taker on the outside of the ring. 
Nick Jackson missed the dunk, but still delivered the Indy taker. And to make amends on his error, he got the ball back, did a slam dunk, shouting down the camera lens. That's what was supposed to happen. And after a BTE trigger, John Silver was pinned, leaving only Hangman against the Elite. Now it's sort of a beautiful win-win situation for uh, Nick Jackson there with the Indy Taker slam dunk combination. If he makes it, it's a bit more embarrassing for John Silver and he looks like a terrible guy. And if he misses, it's sort of like the deluded heel that you love to see in pro wrestling where they think they're the best, but in reality, sometimes they just can't execute a simple slam dunk and an Indy Taker. And certainly the crowd let him know that he still missed. They were chanting that as the match continued. And it was a beautiful callback to Revolution back in 2020, the beginning of last year, and arguably the greatest tag team match of all time when Hangman Page, the Bucks, and Omega were all in the ring together. But in last year's match, it was Kenny Omega and Hangman Page who were teammates as they fought for the titles against the Young Bucks. And that was, Page was the only one left. He stepped into the ring, and opposite him was the were his three opponents. The Young Bucks stepped out of the ring, and it was just Omega left. And at that point, Kenny Omega took off his shirt. And we've seen this in the past when Omega still has his shirt on for certain matches, and that's typically when he doesn't value or respect his opponent. A year ago at Fight for the Fallen in 2020, he kept his shirt on during the beginning of the match. Uh, when he faced off against Marco Stunt. Marco Stunt, very famous for being such a short wrestler, standing at only five feet, two inches. So just 62 inches tall. He had his shirt on for that and then ended up taking it off. We saw that again here. He takes it off and the pair start going at it. Hangman was able to get back on offense despite the numbers game catching up to him. He kicked out of a triple super kick and a 450 splash. It seemed like no matter what the Young Bucks and Omega could do. Hangman Page is always there trying to counter it and kick out. And after that offense, the triple super kick in the 450 splash, Omega missed a V trigger and Page was able to backflip out of a German suplex, delivered a big clothesline to Omega and a leaping lariat to the Young Bucks. He threw Nick out of the ring, and did a big Arihara moonsault that is almost synonymous with Hangman Page now to the outside and back in the ring. Omega delivered a big chop to Hangman Page, but quickly rebounding off the ropes, Omega was met with a big power bomb and a high stack pin. And Nick Jackson actually had to break it up, which was another great touch. You see so often that when these wrestlers have to come in and break the pin up, the wrestler on the bottom who's getting pinned kind of also kicks out. Omega didn't make any motion at all like he was going to kick out. So Nick really had to come in and save him, keep him alive in the match, and make sure that they would come out on top. Later on, Page would miss a buckshot lariat on Matt Jackson and ended up fighting out of a pile driver. And then he hit a double buckshot lariat to the Young Bucks and pinned Matt Jackson to make it a two-on-one situation. And at that moment, everyone in the crowd was, and I assume everyone at home as well, thinking, could Adam Page really defeat the elite and win his title shot as the number one contender. And so that was a great bit of drama that they built throughout the match. Hangman Page always has had a problem with doubting himself. And we see that on TV as well as the build up to all these matches. And that ultimately led to him trying to quit the elite earlier on a couple of years ago. So with Omega back in the ring, he went to go swing the tag team championship belt uh, but he did so in an obvious manner so that Rick Knox, the referee, would see him try to do it. He takes the belt away, and that's when Omega gets past the AEW championship. Swung for the fences. Hangman, though, dodged out of the way. He was able to counter it with a dead eye for a near fall, and then he went outside the ring to hit a buckshot lariat on Omega, trying to finish him off. And outside the ring is another great callback. Nick Jackson grabs onto Hangman's leg. This was reminiscent to when it was the other way around when Paige actually grabbed Nick's leg in the Tag Team Championship gauntlet match in August of 2020 on the 27th. And also even further back to the Revolution match that we talked a little bit earlier on about when uh, Matt did the same thing to Paige on the outside. 
when it would be Nick on the receiving end of the buckshot lariat. Knox noticed the interference, shooed Nick away, and Hangman went to go hit the move, but Omega dodged out of the way, spun around, still holding the title belt, hit Page in the forehead, and went to go pin him. The crowd absolutely roared when he kicked out at two. Omega was enraged, thought it was three, almost assaulted the referee, but then quickly got back down to business. Two brutal V-triggers to Hangman, who was barely in the ropes, trying to get up to his feet, still on his knees, though, and then a one-winged angel to finish it off. Omega closed out the match, threw away the title hopes for Hangman Page and the Dark Order. So if the Dark Order and Hangman Page were able to win, they would each have a shot at the AEW World Championship and also the AEW World Tag Team Championships, which the Young Bucks currently hold. So Kenny Omega, Adam Page, and the Young Bucks are really geniuses at constructing a wrestling match. We've seen it time and time again. And when you combine all four, you really have an ecstasy of gold on your hands. There was no doubt that with such a big match at such a show as in Fight for the Fallen, these great minds couldn't produce a candidate for a match of the year. And I think they did that just then. The drama was measured perfectly. The elite squad uh, taunted and disrespected the dark border like only they can and get away with it. Well, without looking absolutely like goons. Everyone in this match was spot on with their execution. Everyone looked strong. Reynolds, of course, got rolled up at the very beginning, but with a veteran like Carl Anderson, you're going to have that disparity between the wise veteran and the seemingly newcomer in the ring. And it certainly helped that Anderson cheated while holding on to the tights. And thanks for tuning in to my match of the month. You can check out the write-up for this match coming up on backsportspage.com and see all the other matches that claimed the title for match of the month there as well. You can follow me on Twitter at Austin Urch for more wrestling content there. Now let's throw it over to Impact Wrestling's Rohit Raju and his interview. All right, special guest time here on the Cup for Wrestling podcast. Glad to have him back on the show. He was here during season one. From Impact Wrestling, Rohit Raju, thanks, Ben, for coming back on the show, man, taking a few minutes with me. I appreciate you having me. I know we've been trying to set this up for a while now and uh, conflict of schedules and stuff like that, but here we are. Well, listen, you're a busy guy. You know, it's like, you know, you're on, you're on national TV every single week. You're beating up Chris Bay. You're, 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 you're competing for impact championship championships. You know, I, I, th I think you get a pass for being a little busy. I, well, I would hope so. Yeah. 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 I would think so. Definitely. So the last time we were on, we did a little bit of uh, focus on what you've been doing with impact, but we didn't really get a good sense of, of, of Rohit, the man and, and, and how you, became the uh, the, the full-blooded star that we know today uh, you grew up you were born in Michigan and you grew up what what sort of attracted you to pro wrestling uh, my dad was channel changing one day and at least this is the earliest memory that I have and I remember it was WTBS Saturday night and they were showing clips of like Road Warrior matches and one of the matches was them versus the call offs in a chain match. And I was just like, man, what is this? And I was just hooked right there. And then, of course, um, I got introduced into Hogan and like the WWF at the time and the over-the-top characters. And I was just hooked. And I grew up on it. I loved it. I absorbed it. Everything in my life was like either G.I. Joe or Saturday morning cartoons, Kung Fu or pro wrestling. And pro wrestling was always a mainstay. And I never got out of professional wrestling. When I got out of high school, I wanted to go train. It wasn't easy to access the school at the time. There was probably like one or two that were close to me and I didn't have the money to go. And then when I finally had a chance to go, I was working a full-time job and the place that I wanted to go was like two hours away and it was four or five days a week. And I couldn't make that happen by the time I got out of, out of work, the class would have been done by the time I would have got there. And then I found a place that was local. Um, and it was it worked around my schedule. I went there for six months. Excuse me. It was by a guy by the name of Xavier Justice out in Flint, Michigan. And uh, I went and trained there. And then I just started doing local shows. And, and then I started to drive out of state, getting booked. And then it was just you know the typical wrestler started to get on the road and pay your dues. 
And uh, it, it just kept growing and growing and growing. There was a lot of start and stops, a lot of, man, I don't think this is going to go anywhere. And then finally, I caught a break with Impact Wrestling, and boom, here I am today. And I'm still grinding. I'm still trying to make a name for myself now at Impact and keep that name and show the company. And I say this every every single interview that I ever do, show the company that there is value and worth, which I have. I feel like I've proven and I feel like I've shown that I'm a guy there and you can put me in any position and I'm going to make my opponent look good, but also I'm going to look good. And um, I, I kind of know my worth now, my value. And, and so we'll see what's going to happen with impact. You know, I, I love being there and I, I hope they realize what they have. I'm going to backtrack a little bit to when you were right before you started talking about the training and when you when you started figuring out what wrestling was on TV. Who would, did you consider to be your favorite wrestlers as well as a particular match that it's like one of those ones where you can always go back and watch any day of the week because you love it that much? Oh, wow. That really depends. My favorite wrestler now is the Macho Man Randy Savage. I, I feel like he is the epitome of a professional wrestler. He could walk the walk. He could talk the talk. He could tell a great story in the ring. His matches were always from top to bottom intense. Uh, he looked like a million bucks. You know what I mean? He, he, he yeah. looked like a professional wrestler. And he he expanded uh, the world of professional wrestling. I feel like John Cena is the last guy, maybe even Brock Lesnar. But Brock Lesnar I look at as like an attraction. John Cena to me is the last guy that went beyond the world of professional wrestling and can draw in people that weren't fans of professional wrestling. I don't think like there's anyone nowadays that can do that. Roman Reigns, I, I feel like is very close uh, with the way he's this, this whole new persona. It's great. You know, you, you got to let people do them and, and be them. And I don't know what the WWE does, so I can't criticize them or anything of that nature. But I do know as a fan of professional wrestling, Cena is that last guy. I mean, look at him coming back now what kind of a buzz that gave the WWE. Like yeah. I was tuning in like, Oh my God, Cena came back as a fan and just listening to that pop when he came back. It's unreal. You haven't heard that in a long, long time, but going back to your original question, my favorite Russell was back in the day. Of course, Hogan Sting, the road warriors, dusty Rhodes, And then as I started to get into different things, Eddie Guerrero, Chris Benoit, like the, the nineties cruiserweights, those were the guys when I first started to see them, I was like, I could be a professional wrestler. When I started getting into Ring of Honor, Brian Danielson or Daniel Bryan, whatever you want to call them, low key, AJ Styles. These were guys like, man, they're not that much. They're not much bigger than me. I could probably be a professional wrestler. But now as a whole, my favorite wrestler is the Macho Man Randy Savage. I just think he is what a professional wrestler should be. People that don't even know or aren't even fans of professional wrestling know who he is. And that's the type of legacy. It's hard nowadays, but that's the type of legacy I would love to build. And um, you have to, you got to catch that that flame. You got to get that spark in order to, to, you know, create the fire and hoping one day I can do that. And it's one of the things too, I noticed from some of your early years <laughs> in wrestling with your outfits that used to come to the ring in, were very colorful. And like Macho Man used to come out with those very colorful you know, the, the robe on, and it was like different colors every single time. And I noticed that with some of your ring gear in, in the earlier part of your career, you used to have like the, the, the big blue outfit. Then you had you know the, the red outfit too. Is that something that you, you sort of took away from Macho Man to try to change up the, you know, the, the, the like put that flash there so it gets noticed? You always, uh, the entrance is part of one of the biggest parts of professional wrestling. Ric Flair with his robes, you know, yeah. uh, Rick Rude with what, who would he have airbrushed on his tights at the time, Savage with his outfits. You instantly want to be the center of attention. You want to, you want people to see you. Uh, I, Chris Bay, for example, uh, and even Trey, uh, Chris especially, he always has fantastic new gear. He always has a really cool looking vest. And that's, you want to look the part of a superstar, uh, something that really, I mean, and you see it more in indie wrestling than you do TV. Um, and this isn't against anybody, but some people, you, they just get a pass. They can come out wrestling, looking like a guy that works at Seven Eleven, Uh, and they're like, well, wrestling is for everyone. Like, okay, maybe indie wrestling is for everyone, but in order to take that next step, you have to have something 
that makes you a star and that attracts you right away. Jake something, he doesn't dress a certain way. However, his look, I he's like my best friend. Obviously, this is, should be well documented by now. Anytime we walk anywhere, and I mean anywhere, we could walk into a Popeye's chicken. We could walk into a gas station. We could walk into an airport. Everyone, man, woman, and child, they stop and stare at him. My buddy Karam, the same way. Because they have that certain look. They're big guys. They look like big grizzled cavemen. And so instantly they're like, whoa. You know what I mean? Uh, for me, I outside, I just look like a general, a, a normal guy. You know, yeah, I'm kind of bit, uh, built in shape, stuff like that. I'm clean. I'm clean cut, usually well dressed. I don't draw the attention. So when I walk out through that, that curtain or on that stage, I have to draw the attention. Having a flashy robe, a flashy jacket, or just being over the top. You have to attract that. And, and my charisma is what does that for me. Um, once I get a little bit more money, uh, <laughs> the the gear will also – gear is so expensive. And really good gear is very expensive. But uh, well, I, that's what I would like. I would like a, a better-looking jacket, robe, something of that nature that, that instantly you're like, ooh, look at this. What is he wearing today? Oh, he looks sweet. He looks like a superstar. you got to look the part, man. And that's a big difference between – being a guy on a, an indie promotion, which is nothing wrong with that, because there's a lot of great, a lot of great guys out there. Um, but then being a TV star, there's a huge, huge difference. They're worlds apart. And I, I want to go back to that in one second, but I, I had to ask about your training. What school did you end up going to? And can you talk about the <laughs> training regimen and also the experience of like your first couple bumps that you took? Uh, probably was it was it what you expected it to be? My training was very old school. The first time I went, it was a guy named Xavier Justice. He had been wrestling for 10 years. He was a local guy. And I asked, I knew Monty Brown at the time. I knew Monty before, because uh, Monty was from Saginaw. So I knew Monty before Monty blew up. I remember when he, when I heard that he was going to start any training, I was like, wow, really? Monty's going to start training? But when I used to work like at a, a retail, Monty would show up buying stuff. And I just knew him from the gym. And I had asked him, I said, hey, did you know this? Do you know of this guy? And there was another guy by the name of Alcatraz who money, they used to be really best friends and they were wrestling on the scene together. And I asked both guys, Hey, is this guy legit? I'm going to go get trained by him. They said, yeah, he can teach you the basics. He, he'll be able to um, teach you uh, and get your, get your foot in the door. And it was very old school. We wrestled in a barn. There was a ring in a barn and man, in the wintertime, it was rough. We were wearing three layers of clothing, hitting these icy ropes. It was brutal. And I remember when I took my first bump, I just had such a headache. I was like, oh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this. And just getting slammed over and over and over again, learning move after move after move, taking the superplex for the first time. There's no adrenaline there. Uh, you're just trying to learn how to take these moves. And it was rough. It's very rough. People don't realize how rough it is to be a professional wrestler. They think it's a trampoline. They think the ring is cushion. They think it's all easy. No, it's not. That first bump, it's the first time you hit the ropes, first time you take a clothesline, having to be comfortable taking a back bump, flipping without, you know, looking, watching where you're landing. It's different. Totally different. So it, it was rough. And then after I got cleared, I started to go down to the House of Truth. Uh, Truth Martini, very well-known manager, used to – being a ring of honor, great mind for the business. I would go there here and there and get, you know, pick his brain and hear him say things. I went to very, uh, a lot of ring of honor seminars, got to be in the ring with some of the best people in the world, pick their brains, get their advice. And then years later, a group of us went out to uh, the Border City School, Can Am Dojo, where Scott Demore, Johnny Devine, and Johnny Bravo were running things. And we knew that was one of the places to be. So we would go there. We would pick Scott's brain, Johnny's brain. Um, we would pick uh, Bravo. And, and they would just – they would tell us. They would teach us. And it was very uh, – it was just a different style of professional wrestling, very strict, very crisp and clean. So I also – I attribute all of these places um, as far as my training goes, and I credit all of them. And uh, I, when, I, when I say who I get – who I learn from, all three of those places, uh, Xavier Justice, uh, House of Truth, and the Border City School, the Can-Am Dojo, those are the places that I, I credit for my uh, learning. Can you talk about the experience you had out in Ring of Honor? And that's, you know, 
everyone always sort of sleeps these days on Ring of Honor because it doesn't have, I guess, you know, there's WWE, AEW, and the Impact. And Ring of Honor sort of gets lost in the shuffle, but Ring of Honor has such a history of <laughs> unbelievable workers going through there. Can you talk about your experience, uh, some of your finer moments of and what you learned from Ring of Honor and just the experience of being there, knowing the, the legacy that that company holds? If there wasn't, if it wasn't for Ring of Honor, there would be no X Division, because uh, a lot of those guys came from Ring of Honor, and I remember seeing Ring of Honor for the first time and just being blown away. I mean, that's when Dragon Gate got introduced. When I, when I was even a lot of uh, uh, Noah for wrestling Noah. If it wasn't for Ring of Honor, I would have probably. I, I'm sure I would have stumbled upon it sooner or later. But I didn't know who Kenta Kobashi was. I didn't know who Masawa was. Uh, I remember hearing about them from the All Japan days, but I never got a chance to watch them until I was watching Ring of Honor. Same thing with Kenta, same thing with Mirafuji. And that's when I started to go back and, and learn about the history of those guys and just being blown away. Well, that was because of Ring of Honor. Same thing with Loki, same thing with Danielson, same thing with Christopher Daniels, same thing with AJ Styles, Samoa Joe, Homicide, so many legends, Briscoe Brothers, Jay Lethal, so many legends came from Ring of Honor. And I came to a point in my career, I think it was four or five years in, I was doing mixed martial arts at the time, and I didn't really see anything happening with wrestling. So I was like, well, you know, I'll either stick with mixed martial arts or I'll go with professional wrestling. I'll try this Ring of Honor camp and see what happens, see where I stand as a professional wrestler. I think I'm very good. But, you know, let's see what these guys have to say. And I remember Kevin Kelly was there. I went and did this seminar, and I cut one of my promos. And Kevin Kelly put it over huge. I remember he took me out in the hallway and he said, this is the promo I want to see. And he, he, he broke down the promo and he told all the guys this. And then he put me, pulled me aside and he goes, hey, I can't wait to see you in the ring. Uh, and then I remember like Roger Strong was there. Delirious was there. Um, there was Elgin was there. All these top Ring of Honor guys were there. And I remember I wrestled in the ring and I was doing going through the just the training, um, the training stuff, the training drills. But I did it all in character. And Jalarius was like, yeah, ah, I like, this is what I like to see. This is what I want to see. And I, that was my charisma. And I remember they pulled me aside and they said, hey, make sure you do well in your practice match because they're they, they have eyes on you. And I was like, man, I never thought this would be this is cool. I never thought like I would get this attention. And I remember I pulled uh, one of the top guys aside, Delirious aside, and I said, hey, you know, I know you gave us all critiques. Can you give me my critiques? And he gave me my critiques, and I went back. I did everything. I changed everything that he, he told me to do. I went back to a second seminar, and then I got booked after that because he, he recognized this thing. He, you're, in, you're in better shape. You changed everything we asked you to do. We noticed that. Uh, we got a booking for you. And I was like, what the hell? And that was huge at the time. And so each time I would just, anytime Ring of Honor was in my area or a state that was like close to me, I would go to the show hoping to get on. And they used me a few times. I was in the running for the top prospect tournament several times, just never got picked. I did several of their Future of Honor shows. And I thought my future was with Ring of Honor. It just never, and it, it didn't pan out. They started doing shows like in Vegas and Texas and Without a, a clear booking, I couldn't take the time off work to go to it. So it just fizzled out. Nothing ever happened. They never pulled the trigger on me. And I just, it just, not, nothing ever happened. But it, that, knowing that I was good enough to get love from Ring of Honor was huge for me. So I stuck with it. And then, I, like, you know, the stuff with Impact happened. But Ring of Honor was huge for me. Like, uh, I, I still know the guys there. I still talk to. Uh, CB, uh, formerly known as Cheeseburger, um, well, Malcolm Bivens. I remember when I first met him. You know, he's a manager now at NXT. When I first met him, he was he was a gopher. He was setting up rings. He was one of the nicest guys, man. And I still keep in touch with him. So there's guys that I still keep in touch with. Uh, Dan Housen, who I'm really good friends with, is now at Ring of Honor, which is really sweet. So I saw Dalton Castle recently, a guy that I knew from going to those. Uh, those seminars. So it's awesome to see people grow. Moose. Moose was a guy. I gave Moose his first singles match and he always says, it. yeah, I gave, gave me my first singles match. And so it's really <laughs> cool. It's really cool to see, see stuff like that. And before they went to NXT, anytime I'd see Roderick at a show, 
um, he always remembered me because he would always give me tons of advice and he would always pull me aside and say, hey, uh, you're going about this the right way. You're, you're sitting you're here setting up rings. You're, you're working your way up. And I think he always respected that. Same thing with Adam Cole. So it was really cool to see guys like that and see them blow up. And also they would remember me, you know, so I, I would I, I'm sure they'd be pretty, you know, like, hey, man, this guy made it. That's really cool. So I, I, you know, I take a lot of pride in that. So Ring of Honor was a huge staple in my professional wrestling career for me to continue on my path. So yeah, not but respect to Ring of Honor. And it's funny too. You speak so highly of Ring of Honor. And then, what was it like for you that? Okay, so you were really close with Ring of Honor, and then you go to Impact, and now you're on television. What did you learn in those first couple Impact? tapings that you didn't know because wrestling for tv and then wrestling at live events and indie shows are different different worlds a little bit you know it, it is a different world and i say this about indie wrestlers and 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 i'm not hard i don't want this to come across like i'm dogging indie wrestling because i still wrestle in the indies and stuff like that there are a ton of guys that are great indie wrestlers and I don't mean this in a bad way, but there are a ton of guys that are great indie wrestlers, but that are not ready for TV. I would see people come in and do like explosion matches or BTI matches, and they are lost in the ring. It's a totally different aura when you are doing TV. And that's the difference between a guy that can wrestle in front of like a few hundred people or thousands of people and get that really good indie buzz. And then come and have no clue how to de how to be a TV star, be a TV star. This is what I always tell guys. Like, like you can you can do a sequence and, and you can do it half assed, and people will like, oh my god, these guys are the greatest wrestlers of all time. But then you go to TV and there's a larger audience. You can't do stuff half assed. You have to be on point. You have to be crisp because that's the next level. If you wrestle for that next level, Russell will be a TV star, look like a TV star. That's what I try to be. I don't try to be a top indie guy, and I don't think that really gets over. It doesn't get over on the indies, you know what I mean? My style of professional wrestling is guys that are indie wrestlers who have way more followers than me. They probably make more money than me on the indies than I do. However, when it comes to TV, I'm going to blow you out of the water. Yeah. Because – and, and, and that's how I wrestle. That's how I, I want to be. I want to be an attraction, and I learned – before my first stuff at Impact, even in Ring of Honor, I knew you have to hit hard cam, find the roaming cam, and that's what I was made for. I was made for TV. I was made to find the camera, make love to the camera, baby, and uh, cut the promos and be a be a personality. That's what I was made for because that's what I grew up on, and uh, uh, and so that's what it, when I went to Impact and Ring of Honor for the first time, and I knew I had to find the camera. I already knew that in my mind. So there's times when I hit a move, work to the hard cam. I hit I hit a move and I want to show my face. Don't pander to the crowd too long, find the camera because sure there's thousands of people here, but there's millions watching at home and that's where the money is, the millions watching at home. There's the difference. So I knew that going in and I, and I psyched myself up and I studied that. So when I actually did it, that's what I was. That's what I was looking for and working for. Now it comes second nature. Have those facials. Have those reactions. Be a personality. Be a TV star. That's what I want to do. And that's some of my advice to all the indie guys out there that are trying to make it on TV. Tweak your style up. You can still do all the cool stuff that are going to get those fans that you know that are just marks for it. But also, you want to get to that next level. How are you going to be a TV star? How are you going to be different from everybody else that's already on TV doing what you do? That's my advice to guys. Uh, that's that's a world of difference right there. One of the things too, you know, you mentioned uh, you know being doing it for TV, not as much for the live crowd. With the pandemic, it must have been much. It must have been totally different mentality going in because you are wrestling for tv you are not wrestling for a live crowd because there's no crowd there yeah it was weird because there's no there was no crowd so there's no adrenaline when we did slam reversary man you could just they always say in sports the crowd is a six man or whatever you know what i mean you can feel yeah. that you can feel that energy when i walked out there and they're cheering for and they even cheered me I mean, the next day I got booed out of the building, which is, you know, that's what I want. 
but they cheered me. But you can feel that energy and your adrenaline's at an all time high and things don't really hurt that bad. And you, you, when you go backstage, it does. But it's so different when there's a crowd there. Even if there's like 200 people there, it makes a difference. What I'll never forget the first time, I can't remember if it was Rebellion, but we had like that six way fray for the, I think it was for the X Division title or the, or the number one contender or something. And I remember Trey hit me with a forearm. That was the first move I took. And there was no crowd there. And he hit me with that forearm. And I was just like, oof, man, that's rough. And then I remember the first slam I took. I was like, ah, oh, this is going to be really hard. But after a while, you start wrestling. And, and it's just like riding a bike. You're, you start cooking. You start doing what you got to do. And then you, you get in that mindset. It is different, though. There's a huge difference. And I apologize if you hear, like, some gremlins in the background. My dogs are... <laughs> fighting in the background or right in the other room so they sound like like little devil dogs so that's what that noise is oh it's, it's perfectly fine uh it's, it's funny too you you were you were talking about you know with with impacts you know the the six-way matches and i think the last the, your last pay-per-view i messaged you right afterwards and i was just like i was like man that was that was something else and i was like i was feeling your pain after that after that's the uh the ultimate X match. I was looking at, I, I, mess, I remember messaging you saying, I'm like, man, I'm in pain watching it, but man, that was awesome. And, you know, it feels, it must feel good knowing that you'll be able to be recognized for your work because you put so much time in. Um, you and I talked right before we went on air about de who'd help develop your work ethic and it was your mom. Can you talk about what she meant to you and, 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 you know, how a portion of your work ethic came from her? Oh, uh, my mom, meant the world to me. She still does. She passed a few years ago and uh, she passed probably 12, 13 years ago now. Cause right after she passes, when I started getting the professional wrestling and it sucks because I wish she had have seen me. I wish she could have seen what I did and how far I've come. She would have been my biggest fan. She's my biggest fan of everything. And she always made sure that no matter what, there was food on the table. Uh, I come from a single parent home. And my mom would bust her butt. She was going to school full time. She was nursing full time. And I never knew. Now that I look back at it, I was like, man, we were poor for like the longest time. But I never knew that because my mom always made sure everything was taken care of. Christmas was taken care of. Food was taken care of. School was taken care of. But then when I look back at it, I was like, there was a long stint where we were broke. We, we were, you know, there was no cable. I was coming home from school watching Santa Barbara or soap operas because there was no cable to watch cartoons or nothing like that. Or, you know, there was nothing, you know, you just had the local channels um, eating cereal, the same cereal for a long time, but it didn't matter because the energy that she kept was always a positive one. She was always working her butt off. And I remember there was times where I'd, she would just be crying. You know, she'd be crying because she was so stressed out and she'd go in the room and make sure that we wouldn't see it. Of course, I'd see it or hear it and go see what was going on. But as a kid, I didn't know any better. I didn't know how hard and how stressful it was and how hard she worked. So that's where my work ethic comes from. There's a lot of people in the world of professional wrestling, or I shouldn't say professional wrestling, in my life. Like you would think I've had a lot of support. Not really. And it's not a sob story, nothing like that. This wrestling thing has honestly been a journey that I've done on my own. I haven't had a real a lot of support. A lot of people think it's a pipe dream. And um, they, they're they well-wishers, and they, they do want to see me do good. But they don't go to shows. There's a, maybe like a handful of friends that do, and they continue to support me, to continue to, um, you know, wave my flag and stuff like that, which I, I honestly appreciate that so much. But... When it came down to it, everyone thought it was just a dream, which it was a dream. But how is it are you going to make a reality if you don't go after it? They never thought I was told, oh, you're never going to get to the big time. You're never going to get that contract you want. You're never going to get this. Well, I've got the contract that I wanted. And I hope, you know, when it's all said and done, I'll have a bigger contract than I want. And I hope that after that, I'll have a bigger contract than I want because that's what I'm going for. I love professional wrestling. I've, ever, I've loved it ever since I was a kid. And my mom always supported everything that I did. And I think if she was alive, she would have supported that. So, but I've seen how hard she worked. And so I channeled that energy and 
And, you know, no one's going to tell me no. No one's going to tell me I can't do it. And I get that from her. And I credit, I give her all the credit for that. And uh, my only regret is that I wish she can honestly see how far I've come and how far I will go. That's my only regret. So, but yeah, I get all that from her. Miss her every single day. And uh, one of the things else you mentioned before was uh, your love with mixed martial arts and the training you did. How much are you able to take the mixed martial arts and incorporate what you do in the pro wrestling world? When I do see, when I'm, there's a difference. And I try to, I haven't changed up my style because normally Rohit, when I had, when I won the X division championship belt, I had to do something different with it. So I instantly thought Kurt Angle, Eddie Guerrero. Is what I thought. They were, especially Eddie Guerrero, very sneaky, um, <laughs> lie, cheat, steal. You know what I mean? That's what I thought. And people think X Division, like, whoa. I remember so many fans would just piss and moan, well, he's not X Division. He's not doing all this cool stuff. I don't want to. I can if I, if I really have to, but I don't want to. I want to be something different. That's why I changed my wardrobe. You know, I, I wasn't just going to be the Indian guy. I was going to be a different type of Indian guy. I wanted to dress like 98 Dwayne. I wanted to bring that style back. I wanted to be flashy. I wanted to do my own thing. And that's what I did. I didn't do the same X division stuff. I was lying. I was cheating. I was sneaking. And that's what I wanted to do. But then when I had to turn it up, I could turn it up. So that's when I would incorporate a lot of my mixed martial arts stuff, doing combos. You know, you'll see me, duck the hook and hit him with a body shot, then hit him with a hook and then catch him with a knee and then go for the roundhouse and hit him with the sweep. Um, TJP, when he would do the mama splash, I would turn my body, catch him in the triangle. That's all for mixed martial arts. I did Wing Chun Kung Fu for 10 years. I was a black sash in that. I got into jujitsu, did no gi jujitsu at this gym I was going to. Then mixed martial arts started to become a thing. Then I started incorporating the, the boxing and kickboxing with it. Uh, recently, I even posted a video. I hadn't put gloves on in like years. So I put the gloves on and just started doing some cardio work for Ultimate X, man. And it felt like, you know, it felt like nothing changed. Footwork was a little sloppy, but uh, the hands felt good. Chin stayed tucked, hands stayed up. And I loved it, man. I, I honestly loved it. I incorporated a lot when I wrestled more of a serious match, more of a catch as catch can match. Uh, like a lot of my stuff with Trey and TJ, I incorporated with like that style of, of professional wrestling when I have to. A lot of people do it nowadays, so I don't try to. I try to get away from that. I was huge when I first started. That's all I was doing. I was a huge low key and Danielson Mark. So that's a lot of the stuff I was doing. I grew out of that. I, I wanted to be more of a TV star, like I was saying earlier. I wanted to be more of a macho man, more of a Ric Flair, John Cena, rock guys that transcend professional wrestling. And that's the type of style, more of an entertaining style now than a catch as catch can. How important is it for you knowing since you do TV tapings every you know couple of weeks that you're out there on the uh, in the circuit and being able to get reps in? How important is it to make sure you're still out there? Always, man. You always want to stay fresh. Uh, I try new things on the indies, and plus, I make money. Uh, and I like wrestling. I enjoy wrestling. I, I don't want to work a nine to five. I don't want to do stuff like that. I want to make money off professional wrestling. So, with Impact and the indies, it helps. And plus, I still want my name to get out there. I want a new audience. There's so many people that have no idea who I am or they've never seen me wrestle before. They just know of me, but they don't really pay attention because there's no – I have a very niche audience, and it's very small. It's almost like a cult following, and they love what I do, and it grows. You know, When people actually see me do certain things, it grows. Ultimate X. People were like, oh, I wasn't a big fan of Rohit. I didn't really see anything, and then they saw me do like the rope spot and the hook spot. And it was, it was totally different. And people, because I'm not known as a, like, walking weapon. You know, Josh is like, he's known as this this machine, this type of, that style of work. My style of work just really, I don't go super over the top like a Dan Housen. And I don't go straight wrestler like walking weapon. I'm kind of a mix of both. And it, with some people, it gets over. With a lot of people, it doesn't get over. That's just, that's just how it is. I will say I feel like I'm criminally underrated. I don't think there's anyone in the world that. That's the wrestling right now that touches me on a microphone. And me and my friends will talk about that. They're like, I have no idea how your promos are not over. Like how people don't 
lose their you know lose their stuff over your promos. And I don't I don't understand that either. I just for whatever reason the machine isn't behind me and the bandwagon isn't jumping as in uh, I don't have a lot of bandwagon jumpers. But I don't think there's anyone that in professional wrestling that can touch me on the mic. There's a lot of guys that are very close. Um MJF, you know, Jericho can still talk, uh, Cena, but I don't, I think you put me in the ring with any of those guys and I'd be fine. And especially the way I carry myself on the microphone, because a lot of it is just, it's all coming from the heart. I don't think there's guys that can touch me, but for whatever reason, it's just not over. I, I, it's, it's, it is what it is, but that's my style of professional wrestling. I'll continue to tweak it, but I'm not going to change it for anybody because I think there's money there. Once the machine gets behind it, like if Impact were to be like, you know what I mean? Then there's a, there's a different stigma when that happens, when they when like your company gets behind you like that. Um, or if there's a just fans start piling on and then you, you'll have the, the bandwagon jumpers like, oh, they think that's cool. Well, I'm going to jump on too. And then that'll boom, I'll blow up. But until then, you know, it is what it is, but I'm still going to do it. But. Yeah, man. I just it, it, that's just my style of wrestling. I, I th it's funny you say that too. Like if if the machine got went went with it, you know, there's so much going on right now with Impact, with working with AEW, working with New Japan. You know, um, I'm not trying to create a headline, and if we have to edit it out, I'll edit it out. No, it's not a problem. Uh, how much would you like to be involved with some more other cross promotions where you're working with a little bit with New Japan and AEW and some of the other groups that are crossing over right now? I would love it. I would love to go to New Japan. I don't know if New Japan sees me as uh, like give me Yano. You know what I mean? Give me give me something like that. If they want to maybe they see me more as a comedy guy, but I can go with anybody. You put me in a ring, I'll go and wrestle a serious match. I would love to go over there and do some stuff in New Japan because I watch New Japan all the time. That's always been one of my favorite uh, promotions. One of my favorite wrestlers. Two of my favorite wrestlers: Tanahashi and Naito. I mean, you can kind of see it in my style. I do the twist and shout. Uh, that Tana does, and, and I'm, I'm a huge Tana Hashi Mark and uh, his legacy in professional wrestling. Same thing. I, mean, I just I used to watch New Japan back in the day, and I was always a huge fan. I would love to do that. AEW, of course. You don't think I want to? Don't want to go on there and start just ripping those guys apart in the microphone or uh, getting dropped by Sting or having a one on one with Sonny Kiss or something like that? I would love that. Uh, you know, it, it's tough because, like I said earlier, I know my worth. But it's weird, like, if if they don't – someone doesn't see it or they just don't think that they you can help their brand or, or impacts, like, oh, we don't, want, we don't want to push this guy in this direction, you know, you're going to stay where you're at. There's only so much you can do unless you start to catch a buzz and then it becomes undeniable, which is just – and that's another reason with the indies. Like, I like to do that because there's certain things. There's something totally different I do in Chicago. I, I still go by Hakeem Zayn. That's the only promotion I go by Hakeem Zayn at. It's just because I do something different. It's gritty, it's angrier, and it's more of a Steve Austin style that I do instead of like that flashy style. So that's totally different. I try to catch maybe I, I, I catch on something there. But until these companies see you and, and, and want more to do with you or Impact's like, hey, check this guy out. We have We think he can do something for your business. Until then, you know, I'll be stuck in that spot that I'm at until one of those things happen. But of course, like I would, I'd be a fool if I didn't want to uh, that, swim yeah. in one of those pools. You know what I mean? I definitely want to be a part of that. Well, well, the Rohit challenge was 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 some of the most entertaining stuff. I remember. I thought that was probably one of the more entertaining things since. And this is again dating how much impact <laughs> I, I do watch since the, the Matt Hardy did the broken stuff there. The Rohit Challenge was was just different because I felt it was one of the first times they were it was the X Division title also had, like you said before, a character with it. You were you were yeah. adding personality to it. It just wasn't in the ring. It was you were able to give a combination of both, which was which made it different. Um, I always thank Impact for that, actually, because I never thought that would happen. I never thought they would give me the ball. And they did, and I ran with it. And there's several of, you know, guys in the back. They're like, hey, man, your run was one of the best runs. It was very entertaining. It was different. And it was very creative. And Impact, honestly, they let me, they let the reins off me. At first, they were like, hey, we have this defeat Rohit challenge. This is what we want to do. This is what we want you to say. Here's some bullet points. 
And I was like, okay. And then the first time I cut a promo, they were like, hey, go out there and talk. Go out there and just do you. And they, they, they let me talk. They let me say what I wanted to say. And that's when I became comfortable. And I was like, sweet. They're just letting me say what I want. Awesome. And I just have to mention maybe this or that. And they, they gave me the okay. You know, I didn't go out there and say anything stupid. But I was out there just being Rohit, being a piece of trash. And, and it felt so good. And we're coming up on a year. We're coming up on a year, baby, mm -hmm. of the greatest X Division run of all time. That's right, of this lifetime at least. But, man, I, that was some of the most fun I ever had in professional wrestling was my X Division run. The heat I got when Jordan, I took it away from Jordan. They thought she won. And then I took it away from her. I mean, people were so <laughs> angry. I was getting hate DMs. <laughs> and I, I welcomed it because that's what I want. My character, I don't want you to cheer my character. I want you to hate him. And I think I do a pretty good job. I was in Missouri the past few weekends, and I had several people, just a lot of people actually, come up to my table when I was selling merch, and they would all tell me, I really love to hate you. Like There's something about you that I love to hate. You're entertaining. You're good. But, man, I love to hate you. Okay, job well done. That's what I'm. That's what I'm trying to accomplish. You know, some guy came up to me. He's like, "Yeah, you're stuff in Ultimate X Men. You're really annoying. You're really annoying." I was like, "Then I did my job, you Nimrod. You buy something and get out of here." You know what I mean? Like that's what I want. I don't want to be. I don't want to be loved. For I want to be hated. I want genuine old school heat, and I feel like that's that's what I get. So I mean, that's that's my goal. Yeah, no, listen, you do a great job with it. Let's real quick, let's let's do uh, some social media plugs. Let's let everybody know where they can find you. Pro Wrestling Tees slash Row Heat. Oh, I'm sorry, Pro Wrestling Tees.com slash Row Heat. They have a summer sale going on right now, 20% off. Make sure you go get some of uh, those sweet t shirts. Of course, Shop Impact. Uh, they have one of my, a really good selling t shirt on there. I'm going to have a mocha skin manimal design coming up soon. And of course, a few fans want the Heat Rohit shirt. I'm going to have that coming up. I don't know which one I'm going to put on which, but uh, hopefully those will be up soon. At Hakeem Zane on Twitter, Raju Zane 80 on Instagram. Then, of course, if you look at Rohit Raju slash the Mad Dragon Hakeem Zane, you can find me on Facebook as well. And I think I'm going to start doing a little something on YouTube. I, I don't ever do it because I want to make sure it looks good, but I think I'm going to start doing uh, the Rohit is real. And um, there's a few stories I have from the road that I'm going to share about me getting hated on. And, uh, and then I'm going to have, to cap it off, I'll have the, a list of the Row Hateful Eight. So and then the top eight haters for Row Hate Raju. I think you can guess a few of those. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that's what I'm going to have, the Row Hateful Eight. That's going to be happening soon. So make sure you uh, be on the lookout for that. Well, we thank you so much for your time. You were more than generous. And uh, just hold on one second, but thank you so much, Rohit Raju. You can catch him every Thursday night, Access TV, Impact Pro Wrestling. All right, that was Rohit Raju here on the Cut Pro Wrestling Podcast. Thank you for all your support and watching the show. Check us out on social media at Cut Wrestling BSP on Instagram and on Twitter and the Cut Pro Wrestling Podcast on Facebook. You know, we're on YouTube as well. Give us a subscribe and give us a like and uh, even write a review. And, of course, we're on where all podcasts are located on Spotify, uh, Apple, Google. We are iHeartRadio. We are everywhere. Check us out, the Cut Pro Wrestling Podcast we are growing every single day. Special thanks to Andrew Fumi, our great uh, producer, director, uh, being able to put the show together for us, make us look as good as we do. Special thank you to Ro Rohit Raju for coming on, giving us uh, some, some of his valuable time. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed that interview. Special thank you to Austin Urch, Jamie Rush, Matthew Sargent, and Jonathan Mowry for all the work you guys are putting in behind the scenes. Thank you so much for making this show uh, grow at the rate it's growing. We really appreciate it. This week was Rohit Raju. Stay tuned for Monday. We're going to make an announcement who's on next week's show. And I promise it'll be just as good uh, as the last couple we've had. We're going to try and make it even better every single week. For Randy Zay from BackSportsPage.com, this has been the Cup of Wrestling Podcast. And we will see you next week here on the Cut Pro Wrestling Podcast. <laughs>